Susan to, um, to go on to the International Space Station. A little background about Greg. He, um, ooh, sorry. has a BSEE and an MS in Physics from Barry Dickinson University and a PhD in Material Science from the University of Virginia. He did postdoctoral studies at the University of Puerto in South Africa. He's taught elementary physics classes and worked as a research scientist at RCA um, labs in New Jersey. Uh, his background is in major phase epitaxial crystal growth and started the company Epitax in 1984 and sold it in 1990, if you don't mind me saying these numbers, for $12 million. Then founded Sensors Unlimited, a near infrared camera manufacturer in 1992 and sold that to Finistar for $600 million in 2000, repurchased it in 2002 in a management buyout, and sold it again to Goodrich Corp. in 2005. Since then, um, you've been in space, and you also are heading up the um, an angel investment group called GHO Ventures, among quite a few other things like winery and a ranch in Montana, and so, without further ado, uh, I, I like this because it's a very informal setting. I see a uh, number of familiar faces that I've known for a long time here. And, you know, that makes me feel relaxed. So, uh, uh, during the talk, if you have any questions, just shoot them out. Uh, you know, I, I kind of prefer to have a dialogue as we go along rather than say the questions for the <coughs> Uh, another thing this will be easier for me because I don't have I don't think I have to explain what the space station is. But if anyone doesn't know or has questions, just you know, ask me. Uh, one of the things I find is um, I, I give this talk a lot to uh, middle schools. My goal is trying to get more American kids into science and engineering. So I, I've given the 130 over 130 of these talks in school years, mostly to fifth, sixth, seventh graders. And uh, again, whatever I can do to get into science, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do. And I find that less than 10% of them know what the International Space Station is, or you know, what it's for, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, as opposed to when I was growing up, we had the Apollo race, the moon uh, program, and everybody knew what was going on. It was like headline news every day. But, uh, in any case, um, just a couple of details about the space station that might be worth uh, noting here. The station is only 220 miles above the Earth. That varies a little bit, but you know, that's something not everyone is aware of. It's not like thousands of miles near the moon. It's, it's just it's actually very close to the Earth, only 220 miles above. And it orbits every 90 minutes. So what that means is you're getting 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. Uh, the other interesting part of it is right now there's a crew of two people on the station. One NASA astronaut and one Russian cosmonaut. And the tour of duty is six months. And when that time is up, you know, two replacement people come up with them. And they fly on a Soyuz, uh, which is a Russian rocket. The other way of getting up is via the NASA shuttle, but that hasn't been flying much in the last few years. So effectively, the only way to get there is uh, on the Soyuz. So one astronaut, one cosmonaut, and the Russians always sell the third seat. Normally, it's to a professional astronaut from a place like Brazil, Japan, Italy, uh, whatever. And in three cases, they sold it to a private citizen. Now, NASA won't fly private citizens. So the only way for someone like me to get up to the station is to go via the Russian Space Agency. So uh, in June of 2003, I was sitting in Starbucks in Princeton, reading the New York Times. If you're ever looking for me, that's where you can find me, about 7.30 in the morning. They have these nice plush chairs. You know, I'm in, uh, I'm in big heaven there. And I read the story about Space Adventures, which is the company that brokered the first two uh, trips to uh, Dennis Tito and all shuttle work. And I'm reading it, I'm saying, oh, this, this sounds like something I'd love to do. Uh, I mean, I grew up in the space age, and now I, you know, I 
sold my company for this outrageous money, and my kids are growing up, and I'm single. It's a good part of my life to do it. So I looked Space Adventures up on the web page, and it didn't take them long to respond. Three years later, there it is. There's a lot of detail between that. Again, most of you know I'm not a professional astronaut. I like to think of myself as a research scientist. I was. But I did have to train for over five months in order to do this. The training was in Star City, Moscow. It's kind of like the Johnson Space Center down in Houston. It's the training ground for Russian cosmonauts. Lots of physical training. We were talking earlier, the hardest thing for me was Russian language training. It's a Russian vehicle. The language, the signs, and the language are going to be in Russian, of course. A lot of systems training. I haven't taken an exam in over 30 years. Last summer I had to take a lot of exams. I went into training almost exactly a year ago. May 13th I began my training. And stayed in Moscow until September 20th when we went to Baikonur for the launch. Some of the training, you can see here, lots of physical stuff. One of the nice things is I got into maybe the best physical shape I've been in since high school. And now I'm in the process of eating and drinking it all away. There's me on the left. This is NASA astronaut Phil McLaughlin and Russian cosmonaut Larry Tucker. That was the crew. In the last two months we trained very closely together. They also called us Space Cowboys because we were by far the oldest crew. More training. Now I've worked, as many of you do, with vacuum systems. I'm used to being on the outside looking in. This is a picture of me in my space suit. It's a vacuum enclosure where they pump all the air out and test it to make sure it operates. Obviously there's no air nor air pressure in space. The purpose of the space suit is if there's a leak in the capsule, that's what they would use to survive. It's an interesting way that they made not only the space suit but the seat for it, which is a very critical part of the Soyuz. I was dumped in a bathtub full of plaster of Paris. I had to sit there until it hardened. Then I was pulled out with an overhead crane, leaving a body impression, just like they do a dental impression. And from that they made the seat and the suit. I had more fittings than a bride at a wedding. A lot of equipment training. This is a smoke mask. I really liked the Russian space agency and how they did space. Now you look at that thing and it looks like a World War I vintage gas mask. And I'll tell you, when you put it on, it feels like it too. But it worked very well. There's a fire on the station. You can't run. You can't open a window. You've got to stand there and fight the fire. So this not only protects your face from the smoke, but this canister is lithium hydroxide, which absorbs carbon dioxide and gives off oxygen. So you can fight a fire for 45 minutes and still survive. Finally, we did a lot of survival training. Now the Soyuz is something like the Apollo. And it even looks like it. I'll show you pictures. Go up, you dock on the station. When you come down, it lands by parachutes. Now if everything goes well, you land in Kazakhstan where we launch. But if we have to do an emergency descent, if something goes wrong, if we're off course, you know, the Earth is 75 percent water, it's likely you could land in water. So we had to be able to train to survive. Now I was not able to fly in the Soyuz or the space station, but I was trained to fly in it. Meaning, you know, if anything went wrong, I could work as an emergency. And that's what most of my training was about, the emergency. One of the fun things I did in my training was so-called zero gravity training.